Alright, give it a shot. This is called the Flight of Red Sophia. Why the sacks? Lewis asked. Sophia looked back at him, curtain still in hand, as she closed the gap between her and the awaiting audience. There were some who ordered their tickets for Sophia's show at the Blue Lagoon a good four months in advance. The reason being, it was one hell of a show. It was my fiance's, she said, dying her cigarette out in an ashtray next to the podium. Is that what makes it? Yes, she smiled. That's what makes it do its thing. It certainly is impressive. Whatever it is, Sophia mused, it's breathing new life into me. Lewis smirked at her, positive that this time her performance would get a standing ovation, perhaps even pick her career up to new heights. Sophia caught another quick glance at the audience crowding in to get seats. Overbooked, as usual, Franco went into the back to bring out some more chairs, the cheap fold-outs. But the respectful patrons did not mind. So long as there was a guarantee that Sophia would perform live on stage, there was never a hostile customer or a disappointed face. Unfulfilled dreams were not welcome in this place. This happening hotspot where people believed they were witnessing someone's soul being poured out through an instrument was not something to be taken lightly. Sophia shut the curtain with a quick gust, unaware that a puff of her, of her unique perfume coasted over the seats, spun within a fan, and spread over table nine. At that table was an unfortunate gentleman who saved all the money he could to see this show. Upon arriving, he was still down in the dumps from being so lonesome, his wife in a mood ever since they could not bear children, but the quick whiff of her entrancing perfume lifted his spirits, and he sat down genially. She's here, the man said to himself. A tear crept out of his right eye. He wiped it away with a light flick of his handkerchief. He didn't want her to see him crying. Lewis continued to be chatting while a comic was warming up the crowd. It was a small teaspoon of syrup to an already rather perfect Sunday, the young comic knew. But it was also an easy crowd, polite and quiet. They were all just waiting, waiting to be amazed. Sophia, my dear, Lewis lit up the smoke. I'm surprised every time you've harped into that thing. Whatever we got you bottled in here, don't ever let it go. I don't intend to. I can hear them, you know. Some of the people out there, some of them are talking about whether I'll make it. You'll make it, he reassured her. Tonight's the night, for sure. The comic finished and bowed, walking off stage briskly as he winked at Sophia on the way out. Lewis saw him in the back, trying to wax intellectual with one of the stagehands who was a petite little thing. Franco himself leapt onto the stage and prepared the audience for what they paid for. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to the Blue Lagoon. It is our privilege and honor tonight to bring you a talented young lady you may already know. To our astonishment, she was prepared to do a live performance after many months, or many moon if you prefer, to step on this stage. For those of you who are new to this experience, let me just say that what you are about to see is not a trick, but it will indeed be a treat. The audience giggled. So let's put up our feet, hold that timer, and give a warm round of applause to Mrs. Sophia Lorette Chambers. The audience quickly stood on their feet already, clapping their hands red. They filled the once dully silent room into cheers and whoops of joy. Lewis himself was clapping as Sophia looked at him and caught his puzzled twist of face. Didn't know your middle name was Lorette. Like the actress, right? My mother was always a fan of hers. Take care, Jerry. She blew him a kiss and walked out from behind the curtain. To her surprise, they roared louder flinging their hats in the air. The show hadn't even started yet. Franco thanked her kindly and patted her on the hand. He used to do that to keep her nerves at ease. Even when she first auditioned 15 years ago, he was like a second father, patting her on the hand and giving her a sage piece of advice that she remembered to this day. Get up. I don't know what your butterflies are on, but if they're as bright as what I've seen here tonight, you better believe that your career will come off the ground as sure as I'm standing here. The spotlights in the crowded club focused on her sharp but pleasing features. It was clear that she was of Spanish descent. Her hair was pulled back in an orb of black. Her blue eyeshadow accentuated her rustic forest eyes. She wore a long red dress that defined her curves and was, for once, a pleasant forefront to the backdrop of the shimmering midnight blue curtains behind her. The train of her dress was twice her length, 
and covered each end of the stage. She smiled. That smile of hers was electric. No one else could have owned one like it. Thank you, thank you all. You're all too kind. The awaiting audience sat quietly, almost synchronized at that. This was strange to some people, but others knew it was just one of those happy coincidences. My fiancé lent me this saxophone on his 23rd birthday. It was given to him by a man in Thailand who had no love for music. This sax is said to call the lost lover a tune that carries him back. Three months later, my fiancé was never seen again. No, he wasn't as popular as the great Freddie Winecone or Burgess Grass, but he was very good. You've never heard him play because he would always play for me, just me. Now I can tell you with strict confidence that I am not musically inclined. I also do not believe in rumors of his death in the war or of him leaving me. But standing up here in front of all of you, I believe I can call him back. I believe he's still with me. She anchored the sacks in front of her, careful not to tear the front of her dress. Funny, whenever he would show me how to play this, he'd lift the train of my dress and have me walk around the apartment playing up a storm even when what I was playing wasn't fit for God's ears. He said to me, once you get something in motion, there's no stopping it. So now, without further delay, a tribute to my fiance with a, with a rendition of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. Five people were standing up to leave as the lights dimmed, but their friends quickly ushered them to the stop. It's true that Swan Lake was a hard piece especially for someone who admitted they were not musically talented. But some saw it as a sour note to an impending disaster. Violins? Yes, those were fine. Angelic? Flutes? Even better. Lighter, more bubbly, without the side effect of a hangover. But a sax? A sax was risky business for anyone who dared try this piece on their sax. Newspapers called these poor troopers trying to make a name for themselves saxophonies. And like all presses, the newspapers and the readers alike ate that stuff up. There was always a risk that the sound would be dashed by mashed up screeches and making the instrumental sound too polka related for its own good. Still, there might be something to this, this bold feat to conquer the sax. Bill, a regular to the Blue Moon, chuckled as the ignorant dumps, dopes were pulled back into their chairs. He ordered himself a nice bourbon as he stood silent at the bar. Amused at the fact that these poor souls thought she would just belt it out with cheeks bulging. What they didn't realize was that the story about the fiancé wasn't something to invoke sympathy. It just added to the legend of it all. He raised his glass, sure that she couldn't see him in the darkness, and toasted her silently to himself. He ordered a small glass so as not to damper the experience of it all. The song began subtly, as it always did, like a lone butterfly skimming across a pond.